So this week, we're going to learn all about viruses. This week is just like a really general overview of viruses and how they infect the host. And then later in the semester, we're going to go through almost every single viral disease that affects humans. So this week's a good overview for what's to come. So really quick, let's just talk about what a virus is, okay? And there's a few really important things that you should know. Viruses are not alive. They are what we call obligate intracellular parasites. What this means is they need a host. They can't replicate on their own. They can't replicate on a surface. They don't survive very long on surfaces. They need to be inside of a cell in order to replicate. Viruses are the most abundant microbes on Earth. So out of all the microbes that we're going to talk about, you would think bacteria are more abundant, but they're not. Viruses are more abundant. In fact, viruses can even infect bacteria. And later in the, um, this lecture, you're going to hear about these viruses called phage that infect bacteria. You're going to see there's really uh, no universal way how we name or classify viruses, but I'm going to tell you kind of in general how we may name or classify them. This table actually is really, really good. If you want to look at all of the really key important traits about viruses, go in and just check out these things. Now, one last thing about viruses, they're definitely the smallest type of microbe there is. They are so tiny. Like I said, viruses can even infect bacteria. Like he, these images show you some uh, like examples of viruses and to scale, like this is a bacterial cell. You can see it's like ginormous compared to these tiny little viruses. You will never be able to see a virus under a regular microscope. You would need an electron microscope, okay? Like a transmission electron microscope in order to see a virus. Okay, let's talk about the structure of viruses. It's actually pretty simple. All viruses, all of them have to have two mandatory, I say mandatory because they all have these two components. The first thing they all have is some sort of genetic material or nucleic acid. And this genetic material contains all the genes the virus needs to make more copies of itself. Now here's an important rule, and I feel like this comes up again and again and again, so just remember it now. A virus can be either, it can either have DNA or RNA, but never both. So it either has one or the other, either DNA or RNA. Now viruses are kind of weird. DNA is normally double-stranded. DS, DNA means double-stranded. So when you think of DNA, you usually think of those that like the latter, right? So viruses can have double-stranded DNA, but they also could have single-stranded DNA, which is not really typical. It's not something we usually think of. Now, similarly, most RNA is single-stranded. Remember from like high school biology, RNA has just that one strand. So a virus could have single-stranded RNA, or again, very weird, a virus could have double-stranded RNA. But every single virus known right now in history only has one of these four different types of genetic material. And you're gonna see later in the semester this is important for how we group viruses. We group them on whether they have DNA or RNA and there's some, por some important reasons for this. Now the second mandatory component that all viruses have is called the capsid. So the capsid is a protein coat. The protein coat that surrounds the genetic material. So here's what this will look like, okay? The virus will have its DNA or RNA then it has these little proteins that surround the DNA or RNA. This is, all, all of these together, all of these proteins together is the capsid. Each individual little ball that I've drawn here, drawn here is called a capsomere. So capsomeres come together forming the capsid. Now one other term you might see is nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is this whole thing all together. It's the nucleic acid plus the capsid. And nucleocapsid is the bare minimum component that a virus is gonna have. 
Okay, now there also are some kind of optional structures that the virus might have. The first one of these is called a spike. A spike is used by the virus for attachment. It's used so that the virus can attach to its host. So at the bare minimum, it, we could have a virus. Here's the nucleic acid. Here's its capsid that surrounds the nucleic acid. And they might have some spikes. They look like this that extend on the outside of the capsid. This would be the spike. Again, it's used to attach to the host. Every spike is very specific to the host cell it attaches to. So for example, there's a virus called SARS-CoV-2 that only attaches to respiratory cells, okay, that have ACE receptors on them. So this virus, SARS-CoV-2, this is the name of the virus, but it causes a disease called COVID-19. So you'll see in a few slides, the name of the virus is one name. The disease it causes is usually something else. And each virus is very specific to its host. So if the virus is like this, that's all it is, this would be called a naked or non-enveloped virus. Now some viruses have another optional component called an envelope. So basically, you would still have the same nucleic acid packaged in a capsid here, but then there's a second layer around it, and this is the envelope. The envelope is actually a bilayer. It's actually got two layers to it. So this would be the envelope. And you'll see in a little while, the envelope is actually picked up from the host cell's membrane. When the virus is being released from the cell, it steals some of its host cell's membrane, and this becomes the envelope. And then the spikes would be here outside of the envelope. Now, a quick little tidbit of information. You would think the envelope would serve as like protection, but it's actually not the case. Actually, naked viruses are much more difficult to destroy. Envelope viruses are very easy to destroy with cleaning products like Lysol or bleach or um, hand soap, detergent, things like that because the envelope is made out of a lipid bilayer that's uh, very easy to destroy with these compounds, with these Lysol detergents, things like that. So enveloped viruses are less likely to persist on surfaces and less likely to survive cleaning products, whereas naked envelopes may be a little bit more persistent on surfaces and in the environment. I know before I drew coronavirus over here, but I really should have drawn it over here. Coronaviruses are enveloped. Flu viruses are enveloped. HIV is enveloped. All right, so a lot of the common viruses that you've heard of before actually do have an envelope here. They don't survive well for, or for a very long time on surfaces. Now lastly, some viruses have these extra enzymes that we'll talk about later. Uh, enzymes that are unique to the virus that the virus must carry with it in order to replicate. Briefly, let's talk about the shapes of viruses. And guess what? There's only three shapes. I'm going to start over here. So the first shape is called icosahedral. This is kind of what you're going to see the most often. So uh, here's an icosahedral virus. It almost looks like... Um, Here's a nice picture down here. It almost looks like a soccer ball. There's a bunch of triangles that all come together, all right? And they form 20 sides. So it's like a 20-sided figure. Now here's an, a naked icosahedral virus. You can see the spikes on it. And here's an enveloped icosahedral virus. You can see here's the, the capsid itself is the triangle 20-sided shape. And then here's the envelope that surrounds it. Most viruses that infect humans or other animal viruses fit into this category. The second category, pictured here beautifully, is a helical virus. You can see in the helical virus, the, the nucleic acid is in the center, and then there's this helix of the capsid that surrounds it. 
Now, most helical viruses are actually plant viruses, so such as the tobacco mosaic virus or viruses that infect crops. There is one helical human virus. It is the rabies virus. You're going to see rabies has almost like a bullet shape to it. The final shape of virus are the complex viruses. When you were like a kid and you watched TV, they always show viruses looking like the like this, and they probably have some kind of smile, all right? That's actually a complex shaped virus called a phage. All right, so phage are complex shape. Now there's, this is actually a picture of the phage here. There's actually one human virus that's complex shape, and it is complex because it's ginormous and it's just very irregular. These are the pox viruses. Pox viruses are complex. When you hear pox, it is not chicken pox. Chicken pox is actually a type of herpes. Pox viruses include things like smallpox. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about in this first video is how we may name or classify viruses. It's very, we don't really have a very good organization, but as of right now, there are seven orders, 104 families, and 505 genre viruses. Now, when we name viruses, they get a family name. So family names end in viridae. So for example, there's a family called the herpes viridae, and that's a large family of viruses that has many individual genera in it. And then the genre name gets the ending virus. So for example, inside of the herpes viridae family, there is the herpes simplex virus. That is the genre name. Or another example, inside of the herpes viridae family, we have another virus called varicella zoster virus. Now by the way, the genus name varicella zoster that's the official genus name, but the disease it causes is often different. So varicella is actually chicken pox and zoster is actually shingles. So a lot of times we may interchangeably use the names, but just note the disease name is usually different from the genus name. Usually when somebody ta is talking about herpes simplex virus, they may use a term like cold sore, something like that, right? 